you're listening to the Hit or Die podcast with hosts Jake Soldati and Chad Rothberg. Hey everybody, welcome to the Hit or Die podcast, episode 13. We're here with John Savage, the head baseball coach at UCLA. Uh, he will be referred to as Coach Savage from now on. Um, just a little bit about Coach Savage. Uh, he was a standout high school player at Reno High in Nevada. He was a sixth round draft pick. Uh, by the Yankees, and he decided to go to Santa Clara University. He played three seasons there. He ended up being a 16th round draft pick out of Santa Clara by the Cincinnati Reds. Played two seasons in that organization. Spent some time at Nevada, Reno, USC as assistants, and then he was the head coach at UC Irvine for three seasons. And the last 15 seasons, he's been the head coach at UCLA. Uh, he also won the national championship in 2013. In his time at UCLA, he's had 105 draft selections, and 19 of those players have been in the major leagues. 1998, he was uh, assistant coach of the year by college baseball uh, while at USC, and they also won the national championship there. He's been Pac-12 coach of the year in 2015 and 2019, and two-time national coach of the year in 2010 and 2013. That's just a little bit. I mean, if you go to his bio on UCLA, I mean, it's... It's the read. It is. <laughs> it I is. mean, it's we read, read it. We read it from top to bottom. It was unbelievable. His resume, Coach Savage. Thank you for uh, being on our show. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's just great uh, being with the podcast, and and look forward to uh, speaking with you guys. Uh, Coach Coach Purse uh, did the show a couple weeks back, and yep. we we got into you know some great conversation, and and we got to thank him. He kind of got the ball rolling on this, uh, but he did tip us off to. Uh, a rivalry you had in high school at Reno with uh, huh. Matt Williams from uh, I went to Carson High School. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think just in general, you know, Matt and I uh, grew up playing against each other, and he was a phenomenal three sport athlete at Carson City High School, and and then you know before that they had Charlie Kerfield, and uh, after that they had Donovan Osborne, and they had a, a bunch of really good players, Nate Yeski, and a bunch of really good players out of Carson City, but. You know, it was high school sports, and, that, and that's really what what we grabbed. I mean, that was our our whole life was was basketball, it was basketball, and was football. I didn't play football, but then Matt was a the quarterback there, but certainly baseball. So we took a lot of pride in, in winning championships in, in high school. We took a lot of pride in winning the um, you know Northern Nevada championship, and then obviously you'd have a chance to play in the state championship against Las Vegas. But uh, you know, it was. Uh, Day in, day out, you know, I mean, you played against them all the time uh, during the summer, uh, Legion ball back in the day, and then certainly during the spring and the fall. So uh, I really enjoyed, uh, I loved high school baseball, uh, still one of my best moments of my life. Uh, my brother's a head baseball coach at Reno High School, so I admire all the high school coaches out there and certainly uh, look at look at players that do well in high school, and, and I just uh, have a lot of, uh, you know, really good memories of, of of that competition and, and led into uh, certainly my college days. Well, and speaking of your college days, you were drafted in the sixth round out of high school, but you chose to go to Santa Clara. Now there weren't cell phones, there weren't videotape. I mean, how was the recruiting process? Did you know that you had a chance? Cause sixth round back then, that's pretty good. That's yeah. high round. <clears throat> um, Especially so, out of high school. Yeah. Out of high school. And, but your decision to go to Santa Clara. Well, it was, uh, you know, it was a difficult decision, you know, certainly. I mean, they had three compensation drafts, uh, Steve Kemp and Don Baylor and, and several big leaguers. So the, the, the first pick of the Yankees was actually the fourth round. And then Todd Stoudemire Jr. was the, was the fifth rounder and I was the sixth rounder. So I was actually their third pick. So it was a very tough decision. Um, certainly picking Santa Clara was a tough decision. I had Fresno State, uh, UNLV, uh, Nevada. Uh, you know, all sorts, Oklahoma State, Nebraska. I mean, there was a bunch of schools that I had sincere interest in and uh, chose Santa Clara with with Mike Cummins and at the time Jerry McLean. But, um, you know, I don't I don't look back at that decision as, as a bad decision. I had three really good years at Santa Clara and uh, it was a, it was a tough decision not signing a professional contract out of out of high school. But I felt, you know, for my maturity and my, my discipline and my growth, uh, it was just, you know, it, it became somewhat of an easy decision. Back in the day, as you guys know, in the 80s, $100,000 is like a million dollars now. <laughs> yeah. So um, first rounders were getting 100000 And uh, if you got more than that, you were treated like, uh, you know, royalty. So, um, you know, uh, Gary Hughes, uh, New York Yankees at the time, uh, and Murray Cook was a GM. And 
They sent me a, a little uh, telegram, I guess you would say, uh, the night of a graduation. Like you said, no internet, uh, no no TV, nobody followed the draft. It was just all, you know, hey, you, you were drafted by the by the Yankees in the sixth round. And I remember dealing with Jerry Streeter and Tommy Davis and with the Cubs at the time uh, out of Modesto. So, um, and Eddie Bachman of the Phillies and, you know, a lot of really great Northern Cal, Central Cal scouts that I, I got to know over the years. and. Uh, I, 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 I met those guys in high school when I was 16, 17 years old, and I still have, uh, you know, great, great friendships with those guys. So, um, you know, it's a part of my, my time that I felt that, uh, college was the right decision. And I certainly don't regret uh, my, uh, you know, my direction. Were there guys that, uh, on your draft at, out of Santa Clara, you know, how many guys went with you into the draft? You got done your three years there. You know, you know I mean, I had a, a good class. I mean, uh, Mike McFarland was a guy that uh, went the year before, a catcher that, you know, caught a long time with the, the Kansas City Royals. Scott Champrino, Troy Buckley was um, a, a little bit younger than I was. But, you know, we had a really good class and, and, and some really good times there. And, and certainly, uh, you know, deciding as a junior, uh, you know, it felt appropriate at the right time and to go and, and chase your dreams of being a major league player. And like I said, uh, John Oldham took over the program in my sophomore year. Uh, John was a terrific pitching coach and a longtime coach at San Jose City College. And, and back in the day had uh, Chris Cotteroli and Dave Rigetti and, and Dave Steeb. And, you know, back then the JCs, uh, you know, had a, a lot of future big leaguers and, uh, so there was players all over the place, really, and and John certainly helped my uh, progression. Now, getting into the the coaching side of it, there's no secret that you're a fantastic recruiter. Even going back to Reno, SC, Irvine, you know, you'd had pitchers with Zito and Pryor, and again, if you go read that that resume, it's pretty impressive. and And your staff here does a fantastic job. Uh, what are some things you guys look for? Uh, in potential Bruins during the recruiting process? Well, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, you obviously you look at the tools of a position player. I mean, you look at the the throw, the field, the hit, the power, the run, and then, you know, that's that's the five tools that you're looking for with any player. And then that sixth tool really is that makeup, you know. Um, you know, what type of attitude does he have? What type of grades does he have? Is he a good teammate? Uh, does he love the game? Um, is he a good communicator? Is he a good listener? Uh, there's a lot of portions that fall under that makeup uh, tool. But, you know, we look for toughness. We look for competitiveness, for intelligence, a guy that can handle certainly uh, UCLA both, on, you know, in the classroom and, and on the field. We look for good people, really. I mean, we look for people that will want to join a, a positive and winning culture that can add to that. You know, you signed up for a team sport, so you got to be a team player. And uh, baseball is difficult at the college level. I mean, we play at the highest level. Uh, of college baseball and you got 11.7 scholarships. So the salary cap, I always say is, it's not as high as, uh, you know, people think, I mean, it's not football, not basketball where, you know, everybody out there is either on a full ride or, uh, you know, a walk on. I mean, there's no in between. So, uh, baseball is a funny, funny, funny dynamic just in terms of from 25% to a hundred percent. But, you know, I can go on and on about all the kids that we recruited as walk ons and David Berg's a great example. Uh, you know, a, a three-time All-American, a, a one-time national champion, a, a two-time Pac-12 pitcher of the year. Uh, if you look at the likes of Messina and uh, Jack McDowell and, and Barry Zito and Trevor Bauer and uh, Mark Pryor and, you know, uh, Garrett Cole and all, all those guys, I mean, um, you know, they all comes in different shapes and forms. And you just don't never know really what you have until you get it. Um, you know, you, you want to see a player as much as you possibly can, but you know, I would just say, you know, certainly be loyal to, to, to their high school program, uh, be loyal, you know, to the school that they play for, uh, understand that their transcript basically is their resume at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, we ask a lot of questions off that resume. It's not all right there on the, on the transcript, but, you know, uh, it's uh, asking coaches in the league, uh, that play against them, asking coaches that maybe have worked with them on their way up, JV baseball, freshman baseball. Uh, there's just so many uh, connections that we can learn from, and uh, we don't take any of that advice lightly. Uh, we take it very seriously, and we try to gather as much information as we possibly can, and and then we determine if that guy's the right fit. It's all about fit, um, <laughs> and and you know, uh, at at the same, you know, not the best player 
it sounds a little funny, but sometimes the, the, the best player isn't the, the right fit. You know, it, it's needs. Uh, we, we, we recruit off need. Uh, hey, we need two middle infielders. We need a, you know, a left hand hitting outfielder. We need a couple bullpen arms. I mean, we'll recruit pitchers that we believe are going to be bullpen arms. I mean, we're very specific when we recruit guys and, and are very, uh, you know, detailed and certainly honest with them and in terms of what, how we uh, perceive them, uh, you know, and then, like I said, uh, you know, they, things change, uh, you know, they, they could be better than we thought. They could be just as good exactly what we thought or, or possibly, you know, unfortunately not as good as we thought. So, um, it's a little d- different dynamics. So all you have to do is, you know, look at the major leagues and look on the back of a baseball card and understand that they come from everywhere. And it's just, they don't come from all UCLA's or USC's or Arizona State's. They, they come from junior college, NAIA, division two, II, division three, high school, you name it. Uh, they come from everywhere. So, uh, it, it's a, it's a interesting process, but, you know, we, we feel like we do a good job. Coach Ward does a terrific job of identifying players and then we, you know, dig into, uh, you know, everything that they're all about. You're at UCLA. So, you know, academically too, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's not just a baseball thing, you know, and then you also looking for character guys. That's, that's really good stuff. And then fit. I don't think yeah, we need we've to talk about, about it. fit for everybody we've had on here is that's the one thing yeah. that's been the key to everything is being the right fit. Yeah. So we'll stop talking about that. Cause I think we'll just, I mean, let you our just heard it right now from talk about that literally thing. one of the best baseball programs in the country. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, we work with high school players or younger. Yep. Um, you're definitely a great pitching mind. I mean, Coach Purse said nothing but great things to say about you. Puts you in the category with Coach Bennett in the pitching mind aspect. Can you discuss simple concepts, things that UCLA does that a younger player can apply to their bullpen sessions or even just playing catch? You know, looking like a pitcher, moving like a pitcher uh, right from the get-go is very important. Uh, you know, having a strong uh, front side, uh, glove side, uh, good direction. You know, we believe in, in hitting the glove with the down angle, uh, really within a 45, a 60, a 75, a 90 feet rule. We really work on angles and we really work on, uh, you know, the eight, we call it an 18 inch plate because we're, we're, we're even, uh, even number of guys here, but it's actually 17, but we call it 18. But, uh, we believe in, in throwing between the hips. We believe in, you know, riding your front side, getting good extension. Uh, getting that, you know, backside through with a, g- a good flat back. And, uh, we really talk about commanding and dominating the baseball, um, you know, really within the first 90 feet. Uh, and then outside of 90 feet, we talk about, you know, uh, strength. We talk about building arm strength. I mean, uh, it's not so much about command when you get out there. It's really about lengthening your arm, uh, or lengthening the, the flight of the ball, I should say. And not, not so much your arm, but, uh, getting your arm stronger, um, but also throwing it with a, a slight arc and, and throwing it with a loose arm and, uh, you know, having that freedom, I guess you would say, outside of 90, that they can relax a little bit, good footwork, um, and, and really building up arm strength from there. And then, you know, going out, uh, we, we don't have any really minim, uh, minimum distance. They can go out. Uh, we kind of measure what they, you know, what what they look like in terms of how far they can go out. But uh, at the end of the day, they, you know, bring the ball back in, pull the ball back down. And then we get into some, a, a flat ground portion where they're going 75 feet fastball change and, you know, working with the arm speed and, and developing, uh, sameness. I call it with, uh, with the arm, um, making it look the same. Uh, and then they go into a 70 foot little footwork and we're still throwing zero fastballs and a change. And then they get to 60. Then they start moving the fastball and, and then, then the change. So. And when they get to 45 foot, they're going to their glove side and they're throwing breaking balls. So, uh, we, we work on, we work on specific pitches in certain areas. Uh, we believe the changeup can be worked on from 75 feet and in 75, 70 and 60. Uh, we believe the fastball can, can build up strength from those distances. And then obviously we believe the breaking ball is a little shorter pitch, a little 45, 50, 55 foot, just because we want the, the command of the ball. We want the, the top of the ball. We want the, the, the rotation. We want the spin to be tight. Uh, we want spin rate, obviously with the, with the breaking ball. Um, you know, we want the shortness to the slider. We want a late slider. Uh, so there's, you know, each guy's a, a little different. Um, you know, depending on, um, their role, uh, what, what pitches they throw, two pitches, three pitches, four pitches. I believe in that 
you do have to have three, you know, number one pitches in your mind. And then it's a coach's call and, or the catcher's call to determine what, you know, uh, allows that guy to be in the best position to have success as a pitcher and kind of stay away from that weakness and then work on that weakness out in the, in the catch play and long toss. And then the bullpens, we really focus on competing. We work on the execution of pitches. Um, you know, we don't work on mechanics when we work in the bullpen. We work on mechanics more in our long toss sessions and our flat grounds. And then, and then we get into compete mode and before we go on to the main, main mound. So there's certainly a, a buildup. There's a progression. Um, you know, I'd love to, you know, even do a, a video portion of, of the long toss to where kids can see kind of the buildup where they could see it in person. Um, you know, we're having an ABCA brainstorm and I think in October. Um, you know, that, that coaches, you know, should come out and, and see some of that. But at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, it's repeating your delivery. It's very important, uh, knowing yourself, you know, fastball command. It all builds off of that, certainly. And then, um, you know, have one secondary pitch, uh, that can, you can go to in high school. Uh, you probably see a little bit more breaking ball, certainly than, than change up. But at our level, that change up can just, you know, add and subtract that fastball so much to where it can, it can make a 82 to 84 mile per hour fastball, you know, seem harder. And that's what you're trying to do is disrupt timing, you know, to the hitter. You're trying to get good timing. We talk about rhythm and tempo and pace of a pitcher to be on time. And, and when I mean on time is to, 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 you know, keep your tunnels, uh, keep, keep that release point to constantly pour the ball into the zone. Uh, and to, you know, repeat yourself to where, uh, they have to deal with you. It's not me first me, it's me first you. And we talk about that a lot, uh, get in the box, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's kind of an external thought. Uh, a lot of times when we're in the bullpen and in, in the game that we're competing, uh, we're not worried about the mound. We're not worried about the umpire. We're not worried about the, the defense. We're not worried about the slope of the mound. We're not worried about, I'm worried about my health. Those are all things that will certainly uh, promote uh, failure. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of factors that we can talk about. But, you know, I would just say four seam fastballs, uh, you know, we believe in. Uh, we believe in the repetition of, of the fastball really on both sides. When we pitch in, we pitch elevated up. When we pitch middle, we pitch down or we pitch up. And then when we pitch away, we pitch down. Uh, with the fastball and then the breaking balls, you know, we really look to be on the plate and your change up. We want the same track as a, we call it a zero fastball. We want the, we want the Adams to track to where it's kind of a plus minus pitch and, you know, a disrupt, disruption pitch. So, um, a lot, a lot of things that we're looking for deliveries, body types, uh, body growth, uh, projection. Uh, but you know, they all come in different shapes and forms. I mean, Grant Watson was a, uh, the all-time winningest pitcher at UCLA history is a left-hander. And, um, uh, you know, he was 5'11", yeah, and um, the guy was just a competitor. And he, you know, uh, they, don't, they, don't, they don't all look like they're 6'4 and 210 pounds. Uh, they don't look like that in the major leagues. So they all come in different shapes. So you, you got you, you to gotta be yourself, and you got to know who you are and then try to be the best, uh, you know, that, that you can be. And you were talking about you don't have a minimum distance. So did that apply to Trevor? Dre- Dre- the Bauer. Well, He'd Bauer almost threw it to, to, the, to the 405. I mean, you know, it, it was from the foul pole to the 405. So I used to see Trevor throw it over Stanford's huddle and Arizona State's huddle, you know, before the game. And I'm like, Oh God, they are going to destroy him. I mean, literally agitation, uh, agitate them and, and, you know, what's going on here. And he'd throw the ball over them while coach Marcus and, and Coach Murphy, and I'm like, oh, God, you know, these are <laughs> Hall of Fame coaches. And I'm like, and he usually would get them uh, at the end of the day. It was impressive. But, you know, I don't think you want to tick off your opponent like that, like he did a lot of times. You were talking about uh, locating, you know, certain pitches when you're, you know, away working down. And Chad and I were talking about this on the way down. Yep. Obviously, if O2. Yep. Do you, are you big on waste pitches? I mean, obviously with yep. runners on or yep. three, four hitter, it depends on the situation, but like an eight, seven, eight hitter, are you going to, you going to yeah. waste the pitch with no, nobody I, on? No, we, we don't believe in wasting pitches. I mean, you know, every pitch, we want something out of that pitch. And if we don't get anything out of that pitch, we want it to 
certainly build up to the next pitch. And when David Price, I think, led the American League in, in strikeouts, I think he had, I think he had what seventy strikeouts of of uh, strike one, strike two, strike three. I mean, very pitch efficient. And you know, you're looking for pitch efficiency, really. I mean, our motto is two out of three. We want to be sixty seven percent on every pitch we throw: fastball, curveball, slider, change. But um, you know, the good ones can can get swings and misses of pitches out of the zone. I mean, that's the whole premise of pitching is is having leverage over a hitter to where they they will chase. And um, you know, they don't always chase. And then you have to know what you're dealing with. Do they? Is, it, is this a team that chases or a team that doesn't chase? So you may have to get this team out in the zone, or you have, might have to get this team, you know, with small misses. I, I I like small misses as well as a dotted pitch. I think the small misses is a good approach for a young kid to, you know, I almost look at a chain link fence where the, the, and the ball's in a fence. And I, I want that miss to be touching the ball, you know, rather than let's say Nevada through California, rather than going to California and, throwing, and landing the ball in Iowa. You know right, I mean? Right. We don't want big misses. We want small misses. And I think you can get a lot of times I'd say, God, that guy dealt and that guy. And then I'd watch film that and I'm like, you know what? He really didn't deal. I mean, he just, he had mo- small misses. So, uh, that's where that perfection piece can kind of get removed and they can still have success with. But, you know, we don't like wasting pitches. Uh, we don't like, but, you know, at times it looks like you may be, you know, you're, you're trying to have them chase a, a one spot or extra fine breaking ball or, you know, something that's off the plate. I mean, that's, that's part of pitching, but, um, you know, so you don't always go one, two, three and there's a strikeout. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. But, but, you know, it's something where, uh, you know, we really don't want to add, certainly to starters, we just don't want to keep on adding pitches. And if you're looking at, you know, 10 or 15 pitches throughout a start that you're just wasting, that's going to add up and it's going to cost them an inning. And you guys went in 2013. What did that mean to not only you, but the program? Yeah. Well, I think it meant so much to the program. I mean, you know, um, I think every, every college coach strives to, to, to win a national championship as an assistant or a head coach or, whatever. And, um, you know, 2010, uh, you know, we played for a national championship with coach purse and, and coach Vanderhoek and two outstanding coaches. I mean, I have so much respect for them and what they did for our program and coach purse and coach Vanderhoek really took us to a different level, uh, as a program in, in 2010, we played for a national championship for South Carolina. So we knocked on the door in 11, we had Colin Bauer, uh, they left. Uh, people said, okay, let's see how, you know, what, what you're all about now. We went back in 12 with, with David Berg and Grant Watson and, and kind of unexpectedly went back in 12. And then we, you know, knocked the door down, obviously in, in 13. So it meant so much to, to, to coach Adams and, and, and Jack and Rodine Gifford and all the Bruins that, uh, the Bruin families. I mean, everybody that, you know, uh, did everything for this program and played in a program and fans of the program and, you know, UCLA has a strong, strong history of national championships and never won one in baseball. So, uh, it's so hard to win one. You know, I mean, you got to be really good and you got to have a little luck. I mean, there's just no question about it. And, and, uh, so it meant uh, more, I think, to, to the program, to all the people in the past that played in the program, alumni and their, and certainly the families. I love the players. One of my best, you know, memories was getting those rings out to the players and to the doctors and to the trainers and, to the managers and all the support staff. I mean, that, it felt so good, really, just in terms of rewarding people that worked so hard, you know, over the years. So, um, you know, great, great memory and, and certainly, uh, you know, a great time in UCLA baseball. Yeah, it takes everybody. That's awesome. You know, it yeah. takes a whole group to do no it. No question. In 2013, is there anything specific, though, that stands out in your mind that whether it was a regional or, yeah. or on the road to it, that somebody's performance just stepped up and carried you guys? You know, I or? think, I think, you know, Adversity is always a, a room for, for opportunity. Um, you know, you, you don't want too much adversity, certainly in, in a season, but, you know, we lost a series, uh, Arizona State. We lost a series, Oregon State. We lost the last series at Stanford. Um, you know, and then we, we bust home. I remember, uh, you know, uh, knowing that we were in the playoffs, but also, you know, we finished third that season and knowing, you know, that you took a blow really and, and that you, You've already gone through that. So when we started the regional, we had a really tough regional with, uh, you know, uh, San Diego with Chris Bryant, uh, Cal Poly had a really good team. San Diego State, uh, had a good team. So we had a really, uh, 
difficult regional. And, um, and then the super regional, obviously, was a tough one. So, um, you know, I think it's just the adversity of losing those series, uh, not winning a league. I mean, that's I should, it goes to show you uh, how difficult the Pac-12 is. I mean, you know, third place, fourth place, fifth place team can win a national championship. And, uh, you know, so it's about what you endure during the season and what you can learn from it. But uh, the ability to play defense and pitch, I think, will it was the, the key behind that. I think our last 100 innings, I think we either gave up a zero or a one. Uh, so the, there was no big inning. Uh, you know, I think that's a lesson for all pitchers as well is, is you know, min- minimize the damage and, and uh, keeping it at one is, is, is so big. You can give up five ones and still be in the ball game yep. in the sixth inning. Right. And if you give up a two and a four and a three, it, the game can get away from you. So I just think the, the ability to pitch and the ability to, to play catch and, and, and play team defense uh, really was a key behind that whole uh, that whole run. How much uh, experience was on that team, even from 2010? Well, we, we you know we we did have some experience. Um, you know, there was a little bit from that team, but really it was more from the 12 team. Uh, you know, we had Kevin Kramer from Turlock and Pat Valleca, uh, who now both have played in the major leagues. We had uh, Shane Zeal, a converted catcher behind the plate. We had Pat Gallagher uh, from Reno High School at, at first base. We had Cody Regis. Cody uh, Cody went to uh, three Omahas in four years. I think he's uh, the only player in UCLA baseball history. He played second base, Brian Carroll. And of course, we had Adam Plutko, who's uh, pitching tomorrow for the Indians, and and James Caprillion and Zach Weiss. And we, we had a bunch of guys in the bullpen, you know, Grant Watson as a starter, Nick Vandertig in that staff. So we did have some experience from that, uh, those earlier teams, but it was just, uh, like I said, we go back to makeup um, and we go back to team. And, and, and that was what the run was about. It wasn't about tools per se. It was more about team and makeup and, and dealing with adversity and, and then, uh, you know, playing it, playing as a group. And you're talking about PAC 12 play and it's a big thing, even in football, all sports. Yep. Has there been any talk of getting a conference tournament? Well, it's a good question. Um, you know, we've had, I think, four teams, four teams and five teams the last three years. So we feel we have been a little slighted, uh, in terms of amount of teams, uh, when compared to the ACC and certainly the SEC, uh, and even the Big 12 and the Big 10. So the national championships uh, have been won by, by the most by, by the Pac 12, uh, Arizona and, and us and of course Oregon State uh, over the last several years. But you know, USC had a gigantic run in the 70s, and, and Arizona State has their share, and Arizona and Oregon State now has uh, several, and, and we have one, and uh, they're, they're talking about it. Uh, we have, a, actually, I go to San Francisco tomorrow for the Pac-12 meetings, and that's going to be one of the topics, I think, is just trying to see if that is an avenue that we can take in terms of just, you know, it will help us get another team in. Uh, our RPIs are very difficult on the West. Uh, you know, that's a whole nother topic, really. But, um, you know, there's so many good players out here, so many good teams out here, and their RPIs don't really say that. And that's what makes it so tough. And that's why when you see a, a, a team from the West go out to the East or the Midwest and they do very well and they come back here and they struggle all of a sudden, it just, there's so many good players and so many good coaches out here that, uh, it, it, it one of the toughest things I've always said is trying to get to the postseason from the West and, uh, the Big West, the Mountain West, the West Coast Conference, the WAC. I mean, it's it's all very, very competitive. And, uh, you know, the Pac-12 is probably in the best position for amount of teams of all those te- leagues. I don't think anybody would argue that. But it's still, uh, you know, there's some really good teams last year. Arizona was a really good team. They didn't go to the postseason, you know. Uh, Oregon, uh, you know, I mean, there's uh, only five teams went last season. So, uh, there's certainly a, a conversation for that, and, and, and that could be coming in the near future. Talks of like hosting it or where, I mean, just yeah. what it would take to do it monetarily or yeah. things like that. Well, I don't think money-wise putting it on is, 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 is the issue. I think it's just like you said, it's location. Scheduling. Uh, scheduling. You know, is it at a major league site? You know, it'd be hard to put it in a major league site in, in, in late May or early June just because of the wear and tear. Maybe of the ballpark. Stadium in Fresno. Maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah, there you go. Maybe maybe a triple A ballpark in California. I think that would be cool. You know, and then we, we you know, we'd want people there. We want people to we'd want to show the Pac twelve that this you know, we can pull this off and 
you know, have to be on TV sponsorships. And then there's certainly, uh, you know, teams that, you know, that travel. So, um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's worth a, a risk. I guess you would say worth, worth an attempt to, to see if it works. Uh, location is a big part of it. I think you'd have to be in California, uh, you know, in a, in a triple A ballpark or double A or what, or single A, even possibly even the Cal League somewhere. But, you know, Major League Stadium, I think it'd be tough to Oracle or, or Anaheim or, or Los Angeles. I just don't know if a major league team wants 14 games in four days, you know, at their park during a, you know, road trip. So, uh, I, I, you know, I should know more probably by the end of the week, but, um, you know, I think it's kind of leaning toward that, uh, there may be a possibility of that happening. I wanted to kind of go a different direction too. Last season, I think the SEC proposed, uh, to the Division One council a third paid assistant. Yeah. And it was defeated by the council. Yeah, yeah. And for the life of, I mean, I've, I was telling Chad, I, I've read as much as I can and maybe yeah. not enough. Yeah. I can't come up with a good explanation to why it was voted against. Yeah, I don't think anybody can. I mean, we were so discouraged uh, of that coming out. Uh, it, it's so needed uh, for young coaches to get into Division One. It, it, it's needed for our players. The player-coach ratio is, is poor. Uh, it's, I think, one of the poorest in, in NCAA Division One level. We need new blood uh, into the into the system. Uh, we need there's a bunch of good young coaches that are coming up that need an opportunity other than just being a volunteer. Uh, volunteer, you know, depends on camp money and lessons and there's there's avenues of of uh, income. But really, at the end of the day, I think it makes the most sense to have you know an opportunity to to pay that person and, and pay for his insurance and 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 all that and. Uh, you know, I think, I think Eric and, uh, Backage and, 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 you know, Corba, Tim Corbin did a really nice job in, in Omaha of really bringing that out, uh, bringing to everybody's attention. So I think it's going to turn around a little quicker than they anticipated. And I'm hoping that happens. I know the Pac 12 certainly in favor of it. UCLA is in favor of it. Dan Guerrero and, uh, you know, I'm in full favor of it. I mean, I think having a volunteer coach at this level is, is ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever in terms of liability and, travel and you know even the work they I mean, they work and, and and the workload i mean the workload is is phenomenal in terms of hours per week and you know year round and you know so it's it, it makes the most sense to 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 really look at that a lot sooner than i think i think 2022 and and i think corbin and, and backage did an outstanding job of, of presenting it on the national level and everybody saw that so i'm keeping my fingers crossed that uh you know, that uh, there's a new vote and uh, that we somehow can get that passed because uh, you just think about it, it just adds so many new coaches. And then they talk about doing away with the volunteer. We At one time, we thought maybe a volunteer and that position, but it sounds like now that it's just going to be that position. But either way, that job needs to be compensated and certainly added to the uh, you know, paid staff. You know, some of the things I read on it was – the late addition to softball. Yeah. And and so baseball's ratio was 12 to 1. Yeah. Which is terrible. Right. And softball's even 7 to 1. Right. And then I've heard excuses, well, baseball's not that popular. And I was still in chat. I was doing the research on this. Yeah. You know, you had the national championship college football playoff was number yeah. one. Yeah. Final four was two. Yeah. And then the College World Series. So don't, yeah. don't tell me it's not growing. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. is, is so, I mean, do you, do you, I mean, is it just an excuse? Because I can't even see why softball at 7 to 1 couldn't benefit from yeah, it. Yeah. I think. It's hard to say really what the reasoning was behind them turning that down. I mean, people said, uh, you know, hey, it was attached to softball and ADs knew that they, you know, possibly would have to hire two people, you know, one for baseball, one for softball. There was a little talk about that. I don't know how genuine that was, but then, uh, just, just the whole concept of, of, of ratios, like you talked about is it's, it's just unfair and the popularity of the game is, I think really on all time high, you know, I mean, um, they're packing Omaha, uh, the super regionals with the ESPN coverage, uh, the regional coverage. I think every game here was on TV, you know, super regionals were on TV. So I think the, the excitement around college baseball and certainly now with all the percentages and ratios of coming out through major league baseball, I mean, there, there's a lot more college players being drafted and, uh, they're understanding that, you know, they're getting a better product, uh, when they draft a, a college player. So uh, I think the excitement, the venues throughout the country, the SEC has done a great job of, of promoting baseball, um, you know, in their, in their region uh, with their stadiums and their facilities and their TV coverage. And, 
and you name it. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping the Pac-12 can catch up to them. I mean, we, we can play with them. I just hope that the coverage and the, the TV stuff and everything will, will, will match that one day. But, um, you know, I agree. It, it's, uh, we wholeheartedly need another, you know, paid assistant and what the exact reason was. There's a lot of different theories. Uh, you know, um, you know, I think the Big Ten turned it down, uh, kind of out of nowhere. That was kind of a shock. And, you know, I know the SEC was all for it. The Pac-12 was all for it. I believe the, the big, uh, the Big 12 was all for it. But uh, overall, um, you know, uh, we, we have to look at that and understand that, uh, you know, it's only going to help our student athletes. And then piggybacking off the, you know, third paid assistant, 11.7 scholarships. Yeah. I mean, do you think that will ever increase? Well, I think it will increase, you know, what we'll get to, I think it needs to get to a, a 14 number, a 13 number. I mean, 11, seven, you know, you have 27 on scholarship, you have 35 players. That means you have eight players that are either walk-ons or, you know, they have to be walk-ons. They have to be on no money. And then you can have 27 guys, you know, obviously up to a minimum of 25%. It's difficult. You know, you have 50 guys on 50%, 60% turn down a million dollars. I mean, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't add up. You know, it just doesn't, it, we're fighting a fight with a little water gun, you know, compared to a, you know, a gun. I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't quite add up. And the product we have, what we can offer as a student, you know, as a student athlete experience uh, is, is unmatched. I mean, these three, three, these three years, they can't get back that 18, 19 and 20, 21, you know, I mean, we've had seniors that have played in the major leagues. I mean, you don't, you don't all have to go and sign as juniors, you know, to play in the major leagues. I mean, I've seen a lot of great seniors. So uh, there's a lot of different avenues, but um, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's just so important that, um, you know, uh, we look at that and uh, really try to get more money, you know, th- through major league baseball, major league baseball, I think is the key to that whole thing, you know, with the help of the NCAA and just looking, you know, you talk about 35 players and, and 27 on scholarship and 11.7. And then some schools have academic aid. Some schools don't. Some schools have financial aid. Some schools have the WUI program. Some schools have, you know, a, a governor scholarship where you get a, uh, you know, free tuition for a 3.0. So it's not a level playing field at the end of the day. And it's unfortunate that uh, people think it is because it's really not. And uh, there's certain schools that have, you know, advantages. And, uh, you know, there's, there's UC schools and there's state schools and there's private schools. And then, you know, there's, there's schools that, you know, have a ton of academic aid and then, you know, some don't. So it's just, it's a variety of, of mixing and matching really that you have to have just because of the scholarships are so low that you have to look at other ways of, um, of getting legitimate money in, you know, to your families. And I, I heard that in some, I think it was like Louisiana, some states like that. If you go to the college in your state, yeah, you get your tuition paid for. Yeah, like I said, there there's certainly some some schools, you know, you have to meet a certain requirement a lot of times, a a certain GPA, um, and you get a millennium or a governor's or they have different words for it to where you can get a all your tuition and books paid for. So, you know, they, they may like you and you may go into that program as a walk on who gets his tuition and books paid for. Okay, well that's certainly an advantage. And then let's say I really like you. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you room and board. So now maybe that may be 50% and the state's picking up the other 50%. I mean, you're getting a full ride into a player that's only 50% on the books. So there's, there's a lot of finagling going on that really, you know, not everybody is, has access to. And I just, I mean, you know, it's, it's baseball. You know, there's certainly advantages to, to good weather programs. It's like hockey. You know, there's certain, depending on the regions and, and where you are, there are advantages that are, that are not going to go away, but, I think we can do a little better job of handling the the money part of it in terms of what's going to the player. What's what's the player, what type of access does the player have? That's something that I think, I, I don't know when that's going to get cleaned up. Um, that That's a hard one, but uh, it, it's a really kind of an elephant in a room that nobody really talks about in terms of advantages certain programs have over others. Yeah, and you were talking about weather and the facility here is phenomenal, by the way. Uh, the gifts one of the coolest things out the setup is amazing and it looks like there's construction going on out there is there yep. more improvements coming or yeah we're looking to build a, a half infield uh which is uh, with the help of john branca and, and, and rodine gifford and 
and uh, you know, a bunch of people that are uh, you know having their input on that. That that's looking to be done by by hopefully the middle of next year. Um, and then we're looking to build a clubhouse uh, down the right field line. So, you know, we love Jackie Robinson Stadium. It's one of the iconic really places in Los Angeles and certainly in college baseball. But it's just we got to keep up with everybody. Right. You know, we got to keep up with the facilities and and what it brings. But, uh, you know, nobody can match, you know, I think the combination of school, weather, uh, program, conference, uh, there's so many advantages, I think, of, of playing at UCLA. And, you know, all you'd have to do is go ask a Garrett Cole or Trevor Bauer or Chase Utley or Eric Karros or Eric Burns, and and uh, they they would tell you that, uh, you know, it, it led them into a, a whole different world after after baseball. You mentioned the, the Giffords, and in 2018, uh, the baseball community lost Dr. Ken Revisa. Yep. Could you talk about his impact on you personally and even yeah. the, uh, the baseball program here? Well, I mean, you, you talk about a, a figure that uh, changed um, programs, that changed coaching philosophies, that coach that changed players' approaches. I mean, Ken, uh, along with back in the day with Coach Garrido and, and Coach Snow and, and of course, uh, Coach Horton, uh, you know, those guys were really the pioneers of the mental game. And, uh, at least on the West Coast in terms of college. And they brought it in and it spread, you know, it spread throughout different programs. Uh, we brought Ken in 2010 and our program, you know, never been any better really the last nine years. And, and, um, you know, he changed my way of, of talking to, to players. He, he changed my approach. He changed my ability to slow the game down, my ability to, to breathe and, and see things much clearer and, and and understand the big picture and understand that everybody's important and understand that everybody on the team is has a role and it was uh, a sad sad uh, day around here uh, certainly when Ken passed and and for the whole all of all of college baseball he affected so many lives even on the olympic level and college football and and college basketball and professional golf and hockey and gymnastics and uh, you name it uh, he he had he had a say in it, and uh, I know I know Stevie was was here, and and Hookie was was here with with Ken, and uh, Ken was really a Fullerton guy. I mean, that's where he started, and then he kind of leaked over to Long Beach with with Coach Snow and and Coach Weathers and, and Buckley and those guys, and then um, somehow we found Ken in, in 2010, I think, with the help of Hook, and I just can't say you know enough about um, you know what him and Claire, his wife. Uh, you know, meant to our program and really to the all of college baseball and, you know, all the mental game guys out there can really thank him yeah. for, uh, you know, uh, him being the pioneer of, of him getting into the college baseball minds and, and have them listen to, to that part of it. And just, you talk about the tools of the game, you talk about the makeup. Well, the, the mental, the mental game is, is, as everybody knows, is, is a big part of this thing. And, and Ken, uh, you know, taught us so much and he had a, a, a fun way of doing it. And I think it, it caught the players' attentions, the, the coaches' attentions, the, the, the team portion of, of the game. I mean, I still today say that he had as, as big as uh, impact on, on this and on this clubhouse as he did with individual players, just in terms of chemistry, of building chemistry and building, um, you know, awareness to the game, uh, you know, pitch by pitch and dugout and on deck and in the hole and on defense and in the bullpen. And, you know, every, everywhere you had a, you had a Ken, you know, you just had a, you had something to go to. And that's, I think that's what everybody would say about it is, is when you see a player struggle now, you know, what does he have to go to, you know, and, and, and the guys that do seem to kind of, you know, get themselves out of it a little quicker than most. And, I just, it was just, uh, you know, what he did for the, for the game. Uh, Joe Madden could yeah. probably talk year, you know, talk about hours about, uh, Ken and his effect on, you know, their, their world championship. So, you know, it, it just doesn't belong at the college level. It, 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 it can go down certainly to the, to the high school level and, 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 uh, to the, the professional level. And you talk to John uh, Lackey and, and Lester and, and all those guys, and, and they could tell you that Rizzo and talk about the impact that Ken had on them. Um, you know, so no one's immune to it. You know, no one, no one's above the law on that. And, and it's not for everybody. It's not, you know, um, 
I don't think everybody on the whole team uh, is, you know, fully engulfed in it. But at the same time, you know, you can take different portions of it and you could use it at the right time. And and that's really what it's all about. I think think high school would benefit big time. Absolutely. And I think that's probably where it needs to start, to be honest. That way you were talking about character and and that would help out tremendously and help them get to the next level because they already have that mindset because that is that is difficult. Especially, like you said, going from high school yep. to college or even those kids that think they're ready for professional yeah, baseball. Yeah. Well, and the great thing is, is, you know, some of his work's going to live on for, yes. for years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think we're blessed to have that at any level, at any sport to go back and, and look into. I mean, Heads Up Baseball was written, you know, a long time ago and I still, I still open it up and read it. You know, I mean, there's Heads Up Baseball 2, 2.0, but. You know, that the original one with, with Manny Ramirez on the cover, you know, it's just, it's just, it's so meaningful. And it's so uh, now that that belief doesn't, it's not old. I mean, you could talk about all the analytics and you could talk about all the, all the data and all the new wave you know, game. But this other thing is so crucial to, to a player development and, and to a team development. still relevant today. I yes, mean, it, it hasn't changed all that much. No question. Real quick, before we run out of time, I did want to talk about, some of the Central Valley ties here yep. at UCLA, and you had guys like Grant Watson and yep. Max Shu, Aaron Weimer, yep. uh, some local Valley guys, and now yep. on this team you've got Sean Mullen, Jordan Prendes, and and Holden Powell, who were teammates in high school. Yep. Can you talk about maybe some, how those guys are, are looking so far? And well, I, the other I've been here a couple of years. And Powell is obviously a standout, right? He was the closer of the year nationally last year. You know, he was a stopper of the year, and it just uh, we've always had a lot of success. We love that area. Um, you get really good solid, wholesome people. You get good baseball people, people that, you know, a lot of times don't have, you know, uh, agendas and, and really, uh, you know, we, we love recruiting that area. We've had a lot of success and, um, of guys, both position, position wise and, and pitchers wise. And a lot of good coaches, I think in that area, I know the high school baseball is fantastic. And, uh, certainly, uh, you know, the junior colleges are there are very, very strong and, and the coaches are. So, you know what you're getting a lot of times. Uh, so uh, we've had a lot of success. And like I said, we, we love recruiting that area and, and uh, looking to recruit that area, you know, more in the future. Yeah. And getting to that, I've, our audience, you know, they, it's a lot of high school players and yeah. parents of, of players. And, yep. you know, if you have anything to say about helping their kids or somebody get to the next level, yeah, I mean, what would you kind of say? Well, I, I would say. Um, like, what would you want? out of them, how to get here? Well, I would just, you know, trust the people that, that are in charge playing for your own program during the high school summer is, is still, you know, it's rare, but you know, if you're good, the people are going to find you and you don't need to, you don't need to be traveling all over the, the West, the, the South and, and Florida and Georgia. And, you know, you can stay in California. I mean, you want to be as close as you possibly can to the, the schools that, you know, have interest in the camps are certainly are, are a good resource. You know, high school coaches or, you know, college. I mean, my biggest resource is still the high school coach. I mean, they're going to tell you the, the honest truth. They're going to tell you uh, what, you know, they've been around that young man for, you know, uh, day in, day out in the classroom and, and out of the classroom. So um, I would say just pick and choose uh, who you're playing for, what type of showcases, know the recruiting calendar, uh, know when we can go out, when we can't go out. Uh, make sure that you're taking care of the classroom. I think that's a big, big part of this thing is at least giving yourself an, uh, an option. Um, there's all kinds of different levels of baseball. I say this all the time. I mean, not everybody's going to play in the Pac-12. Not everybody's going to play Division One. I. I mean, there's so many really good junior colleges and NEIA schools and Division Threes and Twos and One. I mean, they're all over the state of California. And there's a lot of good coaches, good coaches, just as good as coaches at those levels a lot of times and as a division one level. So, you know, I, I would just say, you know, I mean, multiple sports, um, I'm okay with multiple sports. Um, you know, I know it's getting tougher and tougher on them in terms of playing one. Uh, I like the two sport guys. Uh, I like the football baseball combo. Uh, I was a basketball baseball. Usually you get out a little later because of basketball. You know, I understand that, but, uh, it's, it's really hard to play this game 12 months out of the year. You know, it's just, it's just so difficult. So I, you know, athleticism, you know, don't be such a, a lesson driven player. Make sure you understand the game. 
uh, understand you play the game, understand you play the game the right way, understand you play the same way, regardless if there's, you know, a coach from Fresno State in the stands or if there's not a coach from Fresno State. I mean, that you're the same guy. I mean, baseball is a game that treats uh, sameness very well. I mean, if you if you bring out, you know, your your game each and every day, you look at the Pedroyas of the world and, you know, there's so many examples now in the major leagues that, boy, that guy's, you know, undersized and that guy's, but he's, he's you know, he's a hell of a player. So, I mean, it's just all about, um, you know, you can get good at this game. And uh, as long as you know yourself, you're true to yourself, discipline. I mean, there's a lot of factors now, discipline, um, you know, nutrition, you know, training. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of new stuff. And uh, I would just keep up with all that. And but certainly uh, understand that you signed up for a team sport and understand that you're part of a team. And uh, like I tell the players, there's the, the two best things is not only you improving, but you being on a good team. And, and that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to play a role on that team. So don't complain about coaches. Don't complain about the facility. Don't, I mean, just appreciate what you have and, and understand that, you know, these guys are doing their best and, and that you part of a winning program, uh, you know, everybody wins in that situation. So, um, lot, lot of advice, but be honest, be, be true to the program. You can't play both sides of the travel ball coach and another coach and then, uh, the, the head coach, uh, high school and, and you're telling three different stories. Now you can't remember your story. And, you know, that, that doesn't, you know, it does, just doesn't work. So, um, we talk to those guys and we, we, we're going to get the truth out of him. So, um, you know, just be a good, solid team player. And, and uh, improve your game, and then you you know give yourself a chance. It's good stuff, Coach. I, I can't thank you enough for having us. Um, you know, we didn't get into 2018 or 19 at all. Yeah, I know it didn't end how you wanted to. Yeah, but uh, definitely going forward to 2020, uh, we hope uh, wish you guys the most success and making another run at this thing. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, 19 was difficult. You know, I mean, it was such such a good year. We won 52 games. We we're number one team for 11 weeks. You know, it's baseball, yeah. and, and that there's no guarantees. Uh, and we didn't, we, we didn't, we hadn't lost a home series in two years until until we lost to Michigan, who was the hot team. So, um, just understand, there's no guarantees in this game. And and uh, another thing, last thing I would say back to your question was, you know, this game's a tough game. Uh, it, it's a really tough game, and you got to be able to endure the, the the blows and the negatives and the things that come your way as a young player and, and, and to get discouraged and, and uh, it, it's just a mistake. It's just, you got to be able to get to the next pitch. You got to get, be able to get the next outing. You got to be able to get the next at bat. You got to be able to get the next ground ball. And nine innings is a long game. I always tell my players, I mean, you know, it's a long game. I mean, you can go over three and then here we go in the ninth inning and you're up and you get the game winner and no one even remembers the three at bat. So, I mean, and seven innings for high school, I would say the same thing that, Keep playing, you know, keep playing the game and, and uh, you'll get rewarded at the end of the day. I just hope that they take a lot of the stuff from here because this is just really good. Well, if you say you want to get to this level, uh, you have to. Mm -hmm. There's no dancing around it. Well, I just, I also want to thank you guys for, for doing what you're doing and, and presenting that to the, to the people that really need to hear this. Uh, I think it's a great concept. And like I said, I'm, I'm honored to be on the show. And I know, I know you guys are talking to Coach Vanderhook, who's a, tremendous baseball mind that you'll meet uh, a little later today and and then coach purse who i respect uh you know his his whole baseball family really uh with the baseball right. minds with him and his dad yeah. and and so forth so uh you just have a lot of good people that uh hopefully the the families and the players are listening and and if you can take a, just a couple notes from each person and and kind of help help direct you and 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 your son in the right direction at least you'll you'll you know you'll have the right approach awesome no. exactly yeah. again coach we, we appreciate it again. my pleasure and uh guys this is episode 13 uh hit or die podcast hit or die you can stream the hit or die podcast on itunes spotify soundcloud spreaker and iHeartRadio. the show is also available on youtube for news and updates about the show or to get involved, check us out on Facebook and Twitter at Hit or Die Podcast.